Good morning, church family. So good to be with you today. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I want to welcome you here to the church, those that are watching online as well. And I want to wish you a happy New Year's Eve and a happy New Year tomorrow. So glad you've joined us today. Uh, just a, a quick note, and that is uh, in, in the new year, every year uh, at the start of the year, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. So that starts January 8th and it goes through the 28th. And we would love for you to take part. So I would just encourage you now, begin praying and ask the Lord uh, what you could fast from, uh, whether you're going to do a full fast, a partial fast, Daniel fast, uh, you, you can fast social media, television, at some level, just, just engage. And it's not just subtracting something out of your life, but it's the addition that you normally take that time, which you would be eating or watching TV or social media, and then invest that time in your relationship with the Lord by praying and reading God's word. We'd love for you to take part. So we'll do that in January. We'll pull back away from the book of Luke during that time, and then we'll jump back into Luke beginning in February. We'll, we'll pick up where we left off today. Day. So we are in the book of Luke, and very timely, because today is Baptism Sunday. So if you would, open your Bible to Luke chapter 3. Once again, Luke is a historian. He's given us specific times, specific people, and places so that we can pinpoint this information as factual. What you're going to hear today is true. Jesus Christ existed, exists even now. And it's my desire that you would have a relationship with him. Uh, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody here has embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior yet, but it's been my prayer that you would. It's been my prayer that you would have an encounter with the living God and you would receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So you just need to know that up front. I've been praying for you and so have others. So I'm anxious to see what God does in your heart. Luke chapter three, verse one. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Itura and Trachonitis and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Now this is the John we mentioned of uh, before in Luke chapter one. Remember his mother Elizabeth was barren and an angel comes and says, you're gonna have a child. And Zechariah and Elizabeth have John. And this is John, the Baptist, we always give him like that, that final title. Like it has to be John the Baptist, which isn't his last name. Uh, his last name would be something like Zachariason, but John the Baptist. And there's just certain people that you, you have to say their last name because it just fits. In college, we had a friend, his name was Michael and his last name was Jay. He just went by Michael J. I I mean, it was just natural for us. In, in high school, uh, we had a, a gentleman in our high school whose name was Tim and his last name was Burr. Yes. So Timber uh, was, was his name, all right? So there's just certain people that that's the, it just, it rolls off the tongue. So this is John the Baptist, and he's a unique, unique kind of guy. In Matthew's gospel, he feels like, well, maybe I should describe him to you. And so Matthew says that John is out in the wilderness and he's dressed in camel's hair. Uh, he's got a leather belt around his waist and he's eating locusts and wild honey, which is really kind of weird. And so if you're trying to get a visual picture of what John the Baptist looks like, I'll, I'll give you my visual picture. I picture Uncle Cy from Duck Dynasty, all right? So uh, rather than camo, it's just camel hair, all right? So just a real unique individual. He's out in the wilderness and he's paving the way for Jesus and his message is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's baptizing people. Watch this, it says in verse three, and John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So baptism, that word in the Greek is baptizo and it means submerge, submerge or to dip. And so uh, today we will see baptisms and you'll see the word baptism show up in the Bible and there's different kinds of baptisms in scripture. Uh, we're gonna see a couple of them mentioned even here. Now, the first baptism that we read of in this chapter is a baptism of repentance. That's what John was doing. That baptism of repentance is different than the baptisms that we're gonna see today. Baptisms we'll see today it's a, it's a work of Christ in these individuals' lives. They're identifying with Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. But when John was out there teaching, Jesus hadn't died yet on the cross. He hadn't rose from the grave. He's simply preparing the way by telling people that they need to repent of their sins because the Messiah is on his way. And so that's, that's what we'll see today. is isn't just simply repentance of sin. It is a repentance of sin followed by Jesus Christ changing the person from the inside out because they've received that Messiah. They've received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. 
Another baptism we find even in chapter 3, we get to verse 16, we're going to read that John says that Jesus is going to come and he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Clear picture of the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, symbolized by tongues of fire uh, uh, upon those individuals. Let's, let's move on here. Verse 4, as it is written... So John's out in the Baptist, preparing the way, preaching, baptizing. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, when Isaiah is giving this uh, picture, he's picturing when royalty would come into town, a king would come into town. And so everybody in town, they would get out there on the roads and they would fill in all the holes and they would make what's crooked straight because they wanted to be just right for the king who was on his way. And this is really a picture of our lives and what it looks like before we come to Christ. We bring our broken, sinful lives and he makes it straight. See, the difference is uh, we have a king who is doing the repairing. This king, Jesus, is the one who can take your broken life and transform you from the inside out. The, the, the fact that you could have restoration begins with what John is doing here. It begins with repentance. Repentance begins the process of restoration in your life. When you come to the realization that you are a sinner in need of a savior, and you come to that savior, Jesus Christ, he begins the work of transformation. He takes what was broken, he takes your dead life, and he breathes new life into you. And the Bible says you're a new creation. You have new life in him. It goes on. He said, therefore, so John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You brood of vipers. That is not seeker sensitive. That, that's not seeker friendly. That's not like, hey, why don't you come and hear a, a feel-good kind of sermon? No, this, he's just getting straight to it. He doesn't care about offending people because the time is short. There's, there's not much time. The Messiah is on the way. And the time is short even for you and for me. Our life is a blip. It's a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Today is the day of salvation. If you've heard the message of the gospel of who Jesus is and you've heard it enough times, just know that you aren't guaranteed tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of repentance. Today is the day that the Lord Jesus takes your broken, sinful life and repairs you from the inside out and you have new life in him. It begins with repentance. John goes on. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So we can't claim our parents' faith. It has to be our own faith. Even now, he says, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So John's telling them, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. He's saying that once we repent, that's the moment in which this transformation begins to happen. And you can see the results of it. If, if, people, if, if people learn and you say that you're a Christian and that surprises them, there's something happening. There needs to be fruit being produced. That fruit isn't what saves us. We're not working for our salvation. We're not trying to be good so that we can get God on our side. The fruit is the result of the salvation, the saving work that Christ does on the inside of us. It's a natural thing that begins to happen. We receive Jesus Christ, and then as a result of his spirit living in us, there is fruit. There are good things that follow. He goes on. Luke writes this. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? What, what fruit are you talking about? And John answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to the soldiers, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So here John's paving the way for the very same things that Jesus would be saying. Jesus would come along and he would say, give unto others, do unto others as you would have do to you. Verse 15, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, 
the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. So John comes along and he's, he's preaching. And there's something that begins happening to the crowd as they're listening. The Holy Spirit is touching people's hearts. It often happens in preaching of God's word. The Bible tells us, tells us that Jesus came to preach and he preached the good news. And then when he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, he turns to his disciples, his followers. He said, now you preach the gospel. And the church was born on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and preached to the people. There's something that happens when the word of God is shared and preached and the Holy Spirit spirit begins to open up hearts and eyes and ears of individuals, and perhaps he's doing that for you today. Now, Luke begins to turn and give us just a little bit more background of John. He says, but Herod, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. So here we see John, and he's not just preaching to a crowd. He will go and he'll confront people. So he confronted, the, confronted this Roman uh, governor. He confronted Herod when Herod sinned by taking his brother's wife, Herodias. He committed adultery, and John called him out to his face. John wasn't afraid to go ahead and talk to the political leaders and to tell them the truth. And I know there's people in our culture today that says that that Christians should stay out of politics, that Christians should stay out of the secular realm as if that's possible. Like in in what area, in, in what domain, in what realm is Jesus not Lord? Where where is he not king? Where does God not exist? And so if we come to places in our world that says, you can't talk about God here, you can't bring God into this, that would make that place godless. We have a responsibility to let people know about the kingship of Jesus Christ and to speak the truth. Now, the result of that generally is either going to be revival or riot. And in John's case, Speaking the truth to somebody who didn't want to hear it, who wants nothing to do with God, caused him to be thrown in prison, and it's going to cost him his life. John will die. But it can't stop us from speaking the truth. Now, verse 21, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So here in this moment, we see the Trinity. This is the moment where we see, where we hear Father God speaking. We see his son, Jesus Christ, being baptized. And we have the Holy Spirit descending in the images like a dove. So we have all three parts of the Godhead in one place at one time. And I want you to note something here. Jesus isn't being baptized in the Jordan by John in order to repent of his sin. Jesus has no sin. Jesus is doing this, he says, to fulfill all righteousness. He's doing this out of obedience to his father. He's doing this to identify with sinful humanity. He's doing this as a way to to give a stamp of approval to the message that John is bringing, that the Messiah is coming and that people do need to repent. But Jesus had no sin. It's as if when Jesus goes down into the Jordan and you have all these people who've been baptized in the Jordan River and all of their sin there, Jesus is being submerged into their sin, but their sin was not in him. He had none of his own sin. He was submerged into our sin. And then he took that sin upon him, not in him. He took that sin upon him to the cross. And as a perfect sacrifice, God in the flesh, we celebrated at Christmas, the incarnation, God with us, who never sinned, fulfilled all righteousness. He was the perfect sacrifice. And the thing that happened in that moment when Jesus was on the cross, our sin was given to him. There is wrath from God that is due sin. And he placed it on Christ, the perfect sacrifice. The technical word is imputed. Our sin was imputed to Christ. And then... His righteousness is imputed to us when we receive him and we become a new creation. The the weight of condemnation and guilt that you feel for your sin, that distance that you feel from God, God, Jesus bridged that gap 
by taking that sin. And when you receive him by faith, he washes it away. He removes that guilt. He removes the condemnation and you're new and heaven is your home and you have a new life in Christ. Now, how, how, do, we, how do we apply this? Well, here, here's what I think. So macro view, macro view is John has come and he's preparing the way for Jesus, for people to come to know him personally. And, and I would say in the same way, if you've not received Jesus yet, I'm pretty sure that there's somebody who's prepared the way for you. People who, who maybe even invited you to, to watch the baptism service today. People who have invested in you spiritually. Someone has been praying for you. And this may be the day that you repent of your sin and you receive Jesus and you have a new life in him. If you've already received Christ and you're a disciple of his, it's a reminder that we're to pave the way, that, that we can be the one who prepares somebody else's heart through producing good fruit by, by the way that we love them in Jesus' name, the way that we share the testimony of what God has done in our own lives so that it would make an impact upon them. I know the people being baptized today, they would love it. They would love it as a, as a result of their testimony, as a result of their step of obedience, that it would cause you to see the goodness of God and that you would receive Jesus Christ as your own. That's our prayer, that you would walk out of here a disciple of Jesus, a follower of his, committing your life fully to him. Perhaps today is the day that you repent and you receive Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father. We thank you for all of the work and effort that you have done on our behalf. It's not a matter of us being good and, and trying to navigate this life on our own. It's a matter of what you've done. It's a matter of your sacrifice by sending your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross and then rising from the dead to give us life. Lord, we thank you that it's a step of faith that you call us to. Where we come to you and we just confess, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I pray that you would wash me and cleanse me from the inside out. I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. I thank you that Jesus rose from the dead and gives me life. I receive him. I want to follow you, Lord. I want you not only to be my savior to keep me out of hell so that heaven can be my home, I want you to be my master, my Lord. I want to follow you all of my days and to love you with all of my heart. I belong to 